Welcome. My name is Dan Jacobs. This is the second in a series presented by the Subcontract Management Institute. Uh, you can look down to the lower left of your screen and you'll see my uh, credentials. And so let's get started. We're going to be talking about organizing for subcontract management, critical issue in today's environment. This is what we're going to be talking about today. One, we're going to talk about what we call the subcontract management iceberg effect. We're going to look at this uh, process of acquisition planning. We're going to look at program project contract subcontract management functions, all are players in this process. We're going to be talking about the triple constraint, managing scope, schedule, and cost. And then we're going to identify the players in the subcontracting process. And then we're going to take a look at a notional most effective organization, one that you can look at and ponder on. Now you're going to receive uh, one continuing professional education unit, a CPE, for this webinar. Uh, SCMI is an education partner with the National Contract Management Association. <clears throat> What are the learning objectives? You're going to hear us talk about this quite a bit uh, throughout this hour. Outcomes are determined by people, not systems and processes. Having the right people in the right job at the right time doing the right thing ensures that there is a higher probability of successful performance of a contract. Formation of the most effective organization from the outset is essential. Now, upon completion of this webinar, Here's what we want you to have a better understanding of. The importance of properly organizing. The need to clearly define the baseline from the outset and to identify all the players, stakeholders from the outset uh, at the government level, end user, prime, and subcontractor level. And finally, how to create and tailor the most effective organization for your organization. You want to provide high performance support for these publicly funded contracts. Let's talk about the challenge. The Packer Commission report of 1986 clearly defined the challenges that we have, and they said the single greatest challenge is, uh, and the single greatest risk factor in the acquisition process is the failure of the using activity to adequately define its requirement from the outset. You and I uh, all have experienced that, that we have ambiguous requirements. The second greatest risk factor is the failure of the prime contractor to adequately manage its subcontractors from the outset. And remember, the federal government does not have a contract with these subcontractors. There's no contractual arrangement. There is no privity. Approximately 60 to 80 percent of all acquisition dollars are expended with the subcontractors. That risk still exists. Here's a very quick commercial. The Subcontract Management Institute was established uh, and maintains the subcontract management body of knowledge. Prior to this, uh, there was no standard uh, in uh, the US and globally. There was no standard for this. Uh, SCMI develops and delivers subcontract cer certification programs for subcontract managers and technical representatives, a key player in this whole process. And we certify only when candidate has demonstrated, <coughs> pardon me, that they, they are qualified. This combines online classroom experiential training. What the Department of Defense found since 1990, uh, since they've been training uh, professionals, and certifying them at the Defense Acquisition University, they found that you can be certified, but that doesn't mean you're qualified. So we've inserted that uh, element to make sure that they are, in fact, qualified, and that comes from work on the job. Uh, we have developed an online toolbox, a desktop reference guide, performance support tools, and so forth. This program was recommended by Department of Defense and State Department 
of the Commission on Wartime Contracting as a best practice from uh, activities that uh, we performed in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, this program has been briefed to the heads of the ECMA and DCAA and is su they support the outreach. We have representation in DC, Denver, Los Angeles, Seattle, and Brussels and Tel Aviv. End of commercial. Let's talk about what we refer to as a subcontract management iceberg effect. 68% of all government acquisition dollars are expended on subcontractors and all the attention goes to the prime contractor, not sufficient information or uh, performance is known about those subcontractors. The majority of activities occur at the subcontract level. Now you stop and think about this. We've got public, private, commercial, large, medium, small, and foreign companies involved in this process. Let's talk about what the solution is to that challenge. Leadership must affect change. And focusing just on the Prime's efforts by the government is insufficient in today's environment. Where the bulk of the work looks when the bulk of the work looks below. What we have is a traditional focus, the prime contractor interface at the top of the water. The real question is what's below the water level? The needed paradigm, leadership with a value chain perspective that is focused where the work is performed. Your organization's leadership must realize that this is one of its greatest risk factors. Once again, because the government doesn't have privity, only the prime has privity or a contractual relationship with the uh, federal government. Now keep in mind that the prime has uh, privity with the subs, but the subs have pri uh, subcontractors as well at various tiers. They don't have, uh, the prime doesn't have privity with those subs as well. So let's talk about this acquisition planning process and where it begins. <clears throat> when we look at the FAR, it tells us uh, that acquisition begins at the point when agency needs are established. <clears throat> now what did we identify as the number one uh, risk factor for us? And that's the failure of that organization to clearly define its requirements from the outset. And then it says that acquisition planning means a process by which the efforts of all personnel responsible for an acquisition are coordinated and integrated through a comprehensive plan. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, when you look at, at the requirements from the federal government today, they ask you for a subcontract plan. They are referring to the uh, set-asides, not to the other subcontracts and never once do you see the term subcontract management in the government's vernacular. So we're going to be talking about your most effective organization having uh, or acknowledging all of the players that are responsible for this process. <clears throat> As we said, the current practice validates the government's subcontract plan references the prime contractor's commitment to set aside goals. It seldom addresses subcontract management. And as we define it, subcontract management is the process of managing any contract by a subcontractor. Now you can call them suppliers, distributors, vendors, or firm to furnish supplies or services for performance of a prime contract or a subcontract while ensuring satisfaction for all stakeholders. Let's look at the process. <clears throat> Contract subcontract management process has four stages planning, solicitation, selection, and award, and contract subcontract administration. The process is the same whether you're a prime or whether you're a subcontract or whether you're a sub tier contract. Thinking this through from the beginning to the end, as Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind. This is one of my favorites. As Einstein said, if I had an hour to save the world, I would spend 50 to 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute finding solutions. 
Once again, outcomes are determined by people, not systems and processes. Having the right people in the right job at the right time doing the right thing ensures that there is a higher probability of successful performance of a contract. It's essential that you nail the most effective organization from the outset. Let's talk about the various management functions. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that the federal government is a program project management centric organization. For example, Congress recently passed the Program Management Improvement Accountability Act uh, in December of last year. This law mandates that the Office of Management and Budget establish standards and policies for executive agencies consistent with widely accepted standards for program and project management planning and delivery. Now, the Department of Defense is exempt from this particular one because they already have those standards and so forth in place. But what we've seen is an inconsistency uh, throughout the other 14 departments and 136 plus executive agencies. So we begin with portfolio management. Someone in uh, your organization and also in the government uh, has to manage all of the projects or programs and making sure that uh, they're affecting uh, sufficient management to make sure that they meet the strategic business objectives uh, and this is defined by Project Management Institute which is the global standard for project management and by the way uh, in 1993 uh, the federal government represented by the Department of Defense and PMI entered into a cooperative agreement to jointly maintain the project management body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Program management defined as a group of related projects managed in a coordinated way to obtain benefits and control not necessarily available for managing them individually. In other words, you're managing your resources collectively. So here we get down to the, the nitty gritty project management. A temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product or service. Therefore, project management is the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities to meet the project requirements. Okay, PMI defines that as well. Okay. I'm looking at the the guidelines here that I've got for this webinar to make sure that we've got everybody included here. Okay. Now. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about, continue talking about the uh, program project contract, subcontract management functions. <clears throat> Contract management as defined by the National Contract Management Association, the industry standard for project management. It's a process of managing contracts, deliverables, deadlines, and contract terms and conditions while ensuring customer satisfaction. Now remember, we're talking about the management functions involved in the acquisition of supply services data, whether at the prime, subcontract, sub-tier level, but these are the player, these are the functions and they in turn must have players to exercise and execute those functions. We've got subcontract management. <clears throat> SCMI defines it as a process of managing any contract by a subcontractor, i.e. supplier, distributor, vendor, or firm, to furnish supplies or services, performance of a prime contract or a subcontract, while ensuring satisfaction for all stakeholders. You'll see something similar to that in the Federal Acquisition Regulation and definition of a subcontract. Supply chain management. Now supply chain management is the active management of supply chain activities and there are a number of those to maximize customer value and achieve a sustainable competitive advantage. Now we get that from the Institute of Supply Chain Management. <clears throat> then we've got that uh, purchase order that's issued. Uh, that means that an offer by the government to buy supplies and services includes construction and research and development upon specified terms and conditions. This means that we use a simplified 
acquisition procedures. So here we've got all of these functions. Now what about uh, managing the total effort? We call that the triple constraint. Managing a prime contract, subcontract typically includes the following. Identifying requirements, addressing the various needs, concern, and expectations of people. Now remember, we said outcomes are determined by people, not systems and processes. Uh, when we think about this, put it in perspective, when we say uh, addressing various needs, concern, and expectations, in all work there is the known and the unknown. The known is what we agree to in writing. The unknown are expectations. We're also challenged with balancing all of these competing restraints, and each one is different with each contract, of course. We've got scope, quality, schedule, budget, resources, issues, risk, and you know the difference between issues and risk uh, or potential problems. Uh, risk, of course, we identify those ahead of time in our risk management plan. But issues are those that crop up that we did not anticipate. So we have to make sure we clearly understand the difference there. But at the end of the day, we're concerned about scope because in federal government contracting, that's a legal term. You cannot uh, exercise the changes clause if it is outside the scope of the contract. And the reason we use a triangle to define this is that what happens if you change one side of a triangle? Well impacts and affects the other two sides. They change as well. So the moment we don't properly manage the scope, we're going to have a scheduling cost issue. We don't manage the cost, that could impact the schedule and so forth. So we call that the triple constraint. Okay, who are these people that have to perform all of these functions we're talking about? We use a hierarchical arrangement uh, in this context because it's essential that we have a structure. Hierarchical uh, arrangements help groups of people coordinate their activities and gives people information about who does what. It reduces the need to bargain and argue over such decisions. <laughs> Interesting, Google initially tried to work without managers but found that the lack of hierarchy created chaos and confusion as they learn even Google needs a hierarchy and what we do know and we see this many times is organizations just aren't organized in a proper hierarchical arrangement to manage contracts and subcontracts effectively. Now when you talk about uh, having a hierarchical arrangement when you look at the interdependence among people in a group as it increases it's even more important the number of functions and personnel and publicly funded contracts demands a clear, unambiguous organizational hierarchy among each of the organizations partic participating in the contract. Once again, outcomes are determined by people. Not systems and processes having the right people in the right job at the right time doing the right thing ensures that there is a higher probability of successful performance of a contract. Formation of the most effective organization from the outset is essential. All right, let's look at the players. We talked about the functions. We talked about hierarchical arrangements. Now let's talk about who the players are. Now, this is a, a work breakdown structure of a generic organization. We're looking at the functional uh, work breakdown structure and asking an answer to the question, what must be done? Now, we look at this and we, we've got uh, a function at the executive level. We've got finance and accounting. We've got administration. We've got business development and marketing. And we've got operations finally the people who really um, make it happen. 
but they can't do it without support from all of these other functions. Now, how that's structured from the outset in your organization is a driver in how you end up with your MEL. So when we look at executive, uh, you have to determine what really must be done uh, by our executives to truly guide uh, and lead this organization. And that begins with a vision and mission, those kinds of things. And clearly understanding the value proposition uh, of understanding and properly format, I mean, uh, forming to support the acquisition process. Finance and accounting, one of the first things that uh, the government looks at, of course, is how do you account for the expenditures uh, to acquire, I mean, to uh, meet the requirements of the contract. And then, of course, there's a, a term, uh, three terms that we use in, in federal contracting. Uh, you've heard of real estate where it says, location, location, location. Well, in government contracting, we have document, document, document. Then, of course, we have business development and marketing. I've actually had clients who uh, let their business or let their uh, business development people select the subcontractors. You can understand how that works out most times. Then, of course, we've got the folks on the line actually making it happen. All the others support that function, but they have a number of functions they must perform as well. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So in creating the most effective organization, there are three methodologies that are proven to do that. And let's take a look at those. One is you develop your work breakdown structure for your organization. What's your mission and what's your vision? Where are you going? Because you have to, as you grow, you may add functions. And in some organizations, you know that one person may cover a large number of those functions. But the first is zero base. Okay, this is what uh, our mission requires us to do. This is what we're, uh, why we exist. And so what does it take to get the job done given uh, the uh, level of revenue and so forth? Those are drivers. But what do we need to do? Uh, and that begins the process. I need a person to do this. I need a person to do that. Or this person can do these number of activities, etc. So once you have that and you've determined that, you say, okay, this is what I come up with as my most effective organization. These are people that are absolutely essential to what I must do to meet my mission requirements and to satisfy uh, our customers. The next is compare it. Compare to an enterprise significantly better than yours. Um, and associations are very good at helping you with that kind of thing. They have organizations you can contact and so forth, or they have uh, models that you can follow. But the point being is compare to an enterprise that's better than yours that you're aware of and see what they do and how they do it. So much is available to us online. Once you've compared that zero base number, you'll find that in most cases uh, you'll adjust. But then there's one other methodology we have to consider. That's work activity analysis. Determine what work processes beyond the zero base or core should be performed. You may have some unique capability or some unique requirement, and that drives your organizational needs. And once you've done those three things, zero base, benchmark, or compare, consider the work activity analysis, those that are unique and different from the core then you can come up with your most effective organization overall. And that's the right quantity and quality of people doing the right things the right way. Let's look at the nine steps to develop the most effective organization. I find it interesting uh, that organizations dealing with the federal government uh, are not project management centric. And uh, that creates a lot of our problems. Number one, you have to baseline and clearly define the requirements from the outset. And the best tool for that is a work breakdown structure, because you're asking and answering a very simple question. 
what must be done. Well, once you determine what must be done, then you must determine when it must be done. And the third question is, the third step is, you have to identify all the stakeholders. Who are stakeholders? Anyone who has or is uh, impacted by the outcomes of whatever you're doing, your organization. So you must identify all those stakeholders, and they aren't uh, internally, all just internally. You have many, many external stakeholders, particularly in this government environment, a government contracting environment, pardon me. Step five, use that work breakdown structure, and there's a form, uh, a graphic work breakdown structure, which literally is a picture of what must be done. And using that, you identify and assign resources and responsibilities internally in writing for all tasks identified. Because you're asking and answering a question, who will do what? Who's held responsible? And you can see where there must be a coordinated effort throughout the life cycle of this requirement. And it also helps you identify your subcontractors because you execute your make or buy process, which says, okay, what can we do internally? What must we contract out? And you have to exercise due diligence in sourcing. Select the subcontractors, then validate your MEO. Step seven, prepare and execute a contract communications plan. In every, every situation that we've ever been called into on a uh, major program slash contract problem area, a uh, problem, uh, and for example, the Pentagon renovation project for one, uh, is that once we start doing a uh, an analysis, uh, primarily a root cause analysis, one of the things we find literally in every one that's having a challenge is they do not have a communications plan. Absolutely critical. Prepare and execute that contract communication plan. Conduct post-award contract subcontract orientation meetings. Make sure everyone understands what must be done, when it must be done, and who will do what. Prime must negotiate a quality assurance surveillance plan with the government and therefore they should negotiate a quality assurance surveillance plan with each subcontractor. Subcontractors negotiate quality assurance surveillance plans with their sub-tier plans. Quality assurance surveillance plan addresses three issues, and that is how you're going to monitor performance, uh, and that's through meetings, reports, and inspection. And that quality assurance surveillance plan simply says, okay, here's the number and frequency of reports, uh, inspection, uh, and uh, what was the other one? <laughs> Meetings that we're going to have. So it's essential that you uh, share that with all the people involved. And then finally, make sure that uh, in that process that you perform in accordance with the term conditions of the contract or the subcontract. You must manage the triple constraint throughout the life cycle of that program or project or contract. Now, we've been talking about all the players, what must be done, and so forth. Let's talk about uh, the notional, uh, let's look at a notional most effective organization. In this environment. In most organizations uh, that use subcontractors and are in prime uh, or hold prime contracts, uh, they have a corporate structure that supports everything that we looked at before. So we've got finance and accounting. If you look over at the left, operations, program project management, contracts, purchasing, we've got administration and legal, uh, we've got compliance, we've got human resources, quality, ESH is environmental, safety and health, and we have security. Now, they 
provide support at that level to that portfolio manager. And if you don't have a portfolio manager, you don't have a lot of programs, you've got one or two, then that's a whole different situation. But you still have uh, your program managers and you have your contracts managers. And the contracts managers are assigned specific responsibilities for a specific contract in writing. And let's look at the customer that we're interfacing with. We've got program, project manager, interface. We've got the contracting officer. We've got the contracting officer's representative. We'll be dealing with end users and other stakeholders that we've identified that are essential. Now, your program manager and contracts manager are the principal interfaces with the customer on a day-to-day -day basis, but we know that there must be interface by other players on this as well. You're getting corporate support for all of these, and the portfolio manager, for example, uh, determines where can they best leverage the resources they have and how to leverage those resources and what they need to make it happen. Let's look at the subcontract manager. Now, we know that, that we've got uh, an interesting situation in, in uh, this field. Uh, we see some organizations refer to supply chain management as their uh, primary acquisition process, and others have subcontracts managers, etc. Some don't even have the supply chain manager or supply chain function in their organization. But here's what we see as uh, a, a solution. Again, a notional means uh, this is in theory or suggestion or an idea, uh, and it's for us to discuss. You can send me questions and so forth. But stop and think about this. When we look at, at uh, planned and co coordinated customer interface, and those are the critical words, planned and coordinated customer interface, one of the challenges that we have in this and one of the most important players is that technical representative. That's the subject matter expert for the particular uh, supply or service or data that you're providing uh, to the prime or to the uh, government. And so it's essential that we understand uh, how critical that is. Uh, we'd already had a question sent in asking, uh, do we have two separate organizations in subcontracts and purchasing? Uh, and our response to that is absolutely not. Uh, we uh, had a situation. We were invited by a corporation to support it in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was a common problem throughout. And so we went to Afghanistan and walked into this one organization's headquarters. And contracts subcontracts and purchasing were all in three different uh, areas. You know how they were communicating? Through emails. And of course, the reason we were there to solve a lot of problems. And one of the problems we found is that the technical representatives, as well-intentioned as they are, uh, are part of the acquisition process and they do not understand the acquisition process. So one of the things we recommended, and it was uh, recommended, uh, our solution was recommended to the Commission on Wartime Contracting as uh, a best practice, is that that technical representative must be trained. They must understand how critical it is that they, from the beginning, one, read the contract and understand that contract, two, that they clearly identify and understand the scope of the contract and that they cannot authorize changes. So we have a subcontracts manager that is trained and or certified in the process. And working with them are the subcontract administrators, the buyers or purchasing, and the technical representatives. Now, we've heard feedback that well, wait a minute, the technical representatives uh, normally report to the program manager. Well, that's part of the challenge, uh, that one, 
this must be a coordinated effort. And one of the weaknesses that program managers have is that they don't understand the procurement process. But even if they do or don't, the fact of the matter is a technical representative is a contract, subcontract management function. So we strongly recommend that that technical representative uh, be appointed that responsibility in writing, clearly defining their task and clearly defining that they have no authority whatsoever to modify that contract. And that way we're communicating. Same thing with the subcontract administrators. Uh, they all are in constant uh, touch with the subcontract, uh, I mean with the buyers, with the technical representatives, and the subcontract manager literally facilitates that whole process. Now, that subcontract manager is going to interface, as are some of their uh, various representatives down here, particularly the technical representative, are going to interface with the customer. Now we've got the supply chain management function, a very critical function. Uh, this is primarily a logistical supplier development warehousing and inventory function. And of course they must coordinate, absolutely essential, they coordinate with the subcontract manager. In many organizations we see that as a function uh, under subcontract manager, but we suggest that at supply chain management function uh, coordinate with each other uh, on this. It's a major, major uh, effort in this whole process. Now they will be interfacing with the customer and they've got logisticians involved, they've got supplier development specialists, and they've got warehouse inventory control. One of the problems, for example, we have here in the United States and uh, in whatever foreign country we're involved in is that when you're dealing with subcontractors, uh, you get some pretty bad ones. How do you handle that? And how do you manage that risk? Well, this is where uh, supply chain management really uh, shines. Identifying, and in some cases, you find the right ones, you have to train them. But identifying those uh, really effective subcontractors, <clears throat> keep in mind, that you've gone through a make or buy decision process and you've said this function we've decided to contract out. So you find organizations that can perform that better than anyone else. That due diligence is absolutely essential. Uh, and you get those people on board and the government acknowledges when you've got a good uh, subcontractor uh, or a sub-tier subcontractor, uh, folks that the government acknowledges that that's good business and here's the test. The test always in the acquisition of any supplies, services, or data is, is the price fair and reasonable? Keep that in mind. Is the price fair and reasonable? So you've got to make sure that one, one that you're dealing with all the time, do not take them for granted. Uh, go through uh, what the government goes through, and that's a cost realism analysis of any of your subcontractor prices. A recent study showed that uh, subcontractors are making 2% more profit than the prime contractors, so we're seeing kind of a backlash to that. But it's essential that we always perform cost realism analysis to make sure that what we're uh, asking our subs to do and, and submitting to either the prime or, or as a prime submitting to the government that it is a quote fair and reasonable price. So send me in some questions. We'll, we'll respond to them. I've already had one question and that is uh, should uh, subcontracts in purchasing be separate? Absolutely not. You should be in the same organization working together and clearly uh, subordinate to the subcontract management function. Now, the contracting officer, uh, I mean your contract manager rather, uh, has requirements and who goes out and buys 
as a threshold that supplies services and data. Remember the definition in the FAR literally uh, is anything that you're providing that's not provided by the prime. And so as a prime contractor, what you're going to do is <clears throat> you need to do business with organizations that clearly understand that. that. Okay, send me questions and we'll ask and answer those. Now, for those of you who don't know, you just go to your chat room for that, and uh, that should, you should be able to enter uh, any questions. Okay, I don't see any. Hello? Okay, okay, folks. folks. I, I want to uh, thank you for participating in this seminar and leave you with this thought and uh, and the uh, future seminars that are coming up to this success. I refer you to Lincoln who said that if he had an hour to chop down a tree, he would spend the first 50 minutes sharpening his axe. We've got uh, future uh, seminars coming up. Uh, May 15th is source selection. Now, the first two seminars have been free. Uh, we uh, are going to start charging $100 per webinar going forward. And uh, there is discounted pricing for multiple sessions. So once again, thank you very much for joining us. And don't hesitate. Let me give you this again. You can uh, send me uh, an email with any questions you might have after this or give me a call on my cell phone. Thank you very much. Have a great day.